The following video features some of the most horrifying animal attacks on record. These real life cases include the story of a safari tour guide who was swallowed by a hippo while on the job, the tragic story of an elephant who took revenge on an Indian woman in an unprecedented fatal encounter in her village, the most notorious man-eating leopard of all time, and much more. This video does not aim to sensationalize these tragic events, but to educate and spread awareness about the potential risks of venturing into the domains of some of our planet's deadliest predators. Like and subscribe if you're new. You're watching When Animals Attack. In the awe-inspiring foothills of the Himalayas, where tranquil rivers meet its dense forests and air filled with chants from nearby temples, a relentless man-eater once cast a pall of dread over the region of Rudraprayag. This ominous presence was not just a mere figment of imagination, but a very real and deadly man-eating leopard, which would soon be etched into the annals of history as one of the most notorious man-eaters ever known. From the quiet village of Benji where it claimed its first victim in 1918, to the sacred paths leading to the revered shrines of Kedarnath and Badranath, the leopard's reign of terror was relentless and spanned eight long harrowing years. And during this time it wasn't just the isolated traveler who fell prey to the beast, whole villages in fact were paralyzed with fear as the leopard audaciously attacked homes, breaking down doors and even clawing through walls to get to its victims. By 1926, the official death toll stood over 125 people, but many believe the actual number to be much higher, with countless attacks going unreported. The leopard's seemingly insatiable appetite for human flesh and its uncanny ability to strike with stealth and escape undetected earned it a legendary status, turning the once serene region into a landscape of fear and suspense. The leopard's reign of terror began with its first known victim, a resident of Benji village, and this occurred in 1918. Gunga Singh, a hard-working farmer from the village of Benji, had set out as usual one day to tend to his fields, expecting it to be like any other day. The sun was setting, casting a warm orange hue over the terrace fields, as Gunga Singh worked diligently, perhaps preparing the soil or checking on his crops. As the evening approached, the sounds of the village started to fade, replaced by the chirping of crickets and the distant call of birds. Unbeknownst to Gunga, a stealthy leopard was lurking nearby, watching and waiting for the opportune moment to strike. The next morning, a chilling scene awaited the villagers. Gunga Singh's lifeless body was discovered, bearing the gruesome scars of a violent struggle. The ground around him was disturbed, indicating a brief but futile resistance against the leopard. His tools lay scattered, and nearby crops were trampled, painting a grim picture of just how sudden and brutal this attack was. The village, which was now engulfed in a confusing cocktail of sorrow and fear, realizing that the rumors of the man-eating leopard were not just tales but a terrifying reality, would then begin to spread the word. As the leopard's notoriety grew, so did the tales of its audacity. And not long after the first incident, a heart-wrenching tragedy would once again unfold, and this time in a neighboring village. Lata Devi, a young woman known for her vibrant spirit and kind-hearted nature, had been spending a quiet evening with her family at her home. Their humble abode, like many in the village, had open windows to let in the cool mountain breeze. As the family sat together, perhaps sharing stories or discussing the day's events, suddenly and without any warning, the very same leopard, exhibiting an audacity that was beyond comprehension, made its move. With a swift and powerful leap, it lunged through the open window, its eyes fixed on Lata Devi. The room then erupted into chaos as family members shouted and tried to fend off the beast, but the big cat's agility and strength were unmatched, and in a matter of seconds, it had Lata Devi in its grasp, her terrified screams piercing the stillness of the night. It was at this time that neighbors, alerted by the commotion, rushed to the scene, but the speedy and powerful leopard with Lata Devi in its jaws would then vanish into the thickets and by the time a search party was organized and torches were lit, it was tragically too late, and yet another village was left in shock and mourning. The sacred paths leading to the revered shrines of Kedarnath and Badranath, which once echoed with chants of pilgrims and the rings of temple bells, became hauntingly quiet. Pilgrims who once traveled in small groups began moving in large caravans, with hope that there was safety in numbers. Among these pilgrims was Ram Prasad, an elderly man who was known for his deep spirituality and kind-hearted nature. He, along with a group of fellow pilgrims, not long after the last incident was making his way through the dense forest chanting hymns and sharing tales of devotion. As the group traversed a particularly dense part of the forest, the atmosphere suddenly grew tense. The chirping of birds and the rustling of leaves had been overshadowed by an eerie silence. Unbeknownst to the pilgrims, they were being watched, stalked by the very embodiment of terror. Just moments later, once again without any warning of course, the stealthy feline sprang from a patch of brush, its eyes locked on Ram Prasad. The group at this point scattered in panic, 
But the big cat's speed and precision, of course, were unparalleled, and before anyone could react, it would have a screaming Ram Prasad in its deadly grip, his pleas for help drowned out by the chaos. The other pilgrims, paralyzed by fear, could at this point only watch in sheer horror as the leopard dragged Ram Prasad into the underbrush, his cries echoing hauntingly into the forest. The incident would go on to send shockwaves through the pilgrimage route, and what was once considered a sacred and peaceful journey had turned into a treacherous path, with the shadow of the man-eating leopard looming large over every step. It was at this point that stories of the big cat's audacity would become the stuff of legends. On one fateful night, as the village of Kalimath lay enveloped in darkness, the leopard, driven by its insatiable hunger, approached a dimly lit hut. Inside, a family was deep asleep, unaware of course of the impending threat. With a swift and silent move, the leopard would manage to break into the hut, which is when it then targeted the youngest member of the family, a child named Kishin, who'd been sleeping next to his parents. And it was at this point that the leopard would clamp its jaws around the boy's neck, ensuring he couldn't cry out for help. The family would then wake up moments later to the horrifying sights of the leopard dragging Kishin away, and despite desperate cries and attempts to chase the beast, their efforts were futile as the cunning leopard once again disappeared into the night with its prey leaving the family devastated and yet another entire village plunged into mourning with their worst fears realized. While official records documented 125 victims to the leopard of Rudraprayag, whispers in the villages spoke of many more. Some attacks went unreported of course due to them having occurred in remote locations, whereas others were overshadowed by the sheer frequency of the leopard strikes. In the village of Mangoli, as evening approached, the familiar sounds of daily life began to wind down. Parvati and her younger brother Mohan were making their way home their voices blending with ambient sounds of the village. Parvati, with her lively spirit, was sharing stories about her eventful day, while Mohan listened intently. Their usual route took them through a patch of dense thicket, a well-trodden shortcut to their home. Engrossed in conversation, the siblings remained oblivious to the lurking danger. The notorious man-eating leopard, ever watchful, had its sights set on them. In yet another sudden and stealthy move, the leopard would then target Parvati. The beast's stealth was such that Mohan, despite being just beside her, was caught off guard, and by the time he turned to respond to her, she was already being dragged away by the leopard. Mohan's frantic cries would then pierce the evening air, drawing villagers to the scene. The very path which symbolized the quick route home had now become a haunting reminder of the leopard's terror, and once again, yet another village was left with an indelible mark in their collective memory. It was in the village of Kalimath that the leopard's audacity would reach new heights. Raghav's humble abode resonated with comforting sounds of family, and the aroma of a freshly cooked meal wafted through the air as Raghav, surrounded by his loved ones, shared stories from the day during a family dinner. Their laughter and chatter provided a stark contrast to the dangers that lurked outside. As the family enjoyed their meal, an ominous scratching sound echoed from the entrance. The initial confusion quickly turned to terror as they realized the source. The now legendary man-eating leopard was attempting to breach their sanctuary. The sturdy wooden door would resist the beast's initial attempts, but the leopard, relentless in its pursuit, would then shift its focus to the softer mud walls. With each scratch and dig, the leopard carved an opening, its determination evident. The room grew tense, the only sounds being the leopard scratching and clawing and the family's hushed breaths. Time seemed to stretch endlessly until finally, a breach was made, and what was once a dimly lit room was suddenly illuminated by the gleaming eyes of the leopard as it made its entrance. Raghav and his family, frozen in their spots, could only hope and pray as they faced the embodiment of what was their worst nightmare right in the heart of their home. The leopard, with its predatory gaze, scanned the room, its attention shifting from one terrified face to the other, and for a few brief but seemingly long moments, the room was filled with a tense silence, broken only by the soft growls of the leopard and the muffled sobs of the children. This is when Raghav, summoning all his courage, slowly reached for a heavy wooden staff that lay nearby. Without taking his eyes off the leopard, he then whispered to his family to slowly move to the back of the room. And just as they did this, the clever leopard's attention was then drawn to Raghav, almost as if it was sensing his intent. And this was when with a sudden roar, it lunged at him. A desperate Raghav, using the staff, would then manage to fend off the initial attack, giving his family precious seconds to escape to a safer part of the house. The struggle between man and beast was intense, as the room echoed with the sounds of growls, shouts, and the clattering of objects being knocked over. Just as it seemed that the leopard would overpower Raghav, a loud bang echoed through the room, as a neighboring villager, alerted by the commotion, had fired a shot from his rifle, narrowly missing the leopard, but startling it enough for it to retreat. The leopard, realizing it was now outnumbered, would then make a hasty exit through the very same opening it had created, disappearing into the night. Raghav, though shaken and with a few scratches, was alive, 
and the village would rally around the family, providing comfort and support. Amidst the biting cold winter of 1921, the villagers of Tilwara sought solace and warmth around the communal fire. As the flames danced and flickered, casting a warm glow on their faces, the villagers were huddled closely, their breaths visible in the chilly air. The atmosphere was one of camaraderie, with laughter echoing and the occasional song filling the night. Vijay, a spirited young man known for his storytelling prowess, was recounting a particularly engaging tale. His animated expressions and vivid descriptions had everyone's rapt attention, but unbeknownst to them, another unwelcome set of eyes was also drawn to the gathering. Lurking at the periphery of the firelight's reach was the man-eating leopard, its eyes fixated on the unsuspecting group. As the tales grew more and more animated and the night deepened, the leopard would then see an opportunity, and with a stealth that belied its size, it crept closer, each step deliberate and silent. And before anyone could register its presence, the leopard would then spring forth from the shadows, which is when the leopard's powerful jaws would then clamp onto Vijay's throat, muffling any scream he attempted to let out. The force of the attack and the leopard's momentum dragged him away from the fire, his feet leaving a trail in the soft earth. The remaining villagers, frozen by the sudden turn of events, could only watch in horror as the comforting warmth of the fire, which moments ago had been a source of joy and unity, now seemed mocking in its brightness, casting long shadows that seemed to echo the terror of the night. The chilling silence that followed was broken only by the crackling of the fire and the soft whimpers of those who had just witnessed the unimaginable. At this point, the leopard's reign of terror had reached such proportions that it was no longer just a local concern, but had become a matter of state urgency. The government, recognizing the gravity of the situation, would then take decisive action. They dispatched units of Gurkha soldiers, known for their bravery and combat skills, to patrol the affected areas. Alongside them, British soldiers, armed with the latest rifles and guided by local trackers, scoured the forests and hills in search of the elusive beast. The locals, of course, too, were desperate at this point to end the nightmare. They would set up high-powered gin traps, which were large mechanical devices designed to clamp onto the leopard's limbs in hopes of immobilizing it and poison baits were also strategically placed near known paths of the leopard, hoping to end its reign with a single lethal meal. The government, in a bid to incentivize its capture, would then announce substantial rewards for anyone who would kill or capture the beast. This would attract many renowned hunters from across the country, each confident in their skills and eager to claim the prize. But the leopard, with its uncanny intelligence and adaptability, seemed to always be one step ahead. It avoided the traps, steered clear of poison baits, and managed to elude even the most experienced hunters. It wasn't until this backdrop of mounting desperation that Jim Corbett, a name synonymous with big game hunting, would enter the scene in the autumn of 1925. Corbett was not just any hunter. In case you don't know, he was a legend known for his unmatched tracking skills and deep understanding of the jungle and its inhabitants. In fact, he had previously hunted down several man-eaters, and his reputation preceded him. Upon his arrival, Corbett spent weeks studying the leopard's patterns, its preferred routes, and its hunting techniques. He even interviewed locals, visited the attack sites, and meticulously pieced together the puzzle. The hunt was a game of patience and strategy, and there were many close encounters where Corbett didn't even see the leopard, but his instincts had told him that it was nearby, watching him from the shadows. It wasn't until the fateful night of the 2nd of May in 1926 that the climax of this intense cat and mouse game, if you will, would finally present itself. Corbett, after weeks of tracking and waiting, would finally track the leopard and manage to get a clear shot. And with a single bullet, he ended the eight-year-long reign of terror, and the beast that had haunted the dreams of the people of Rudra Prayag lay defeated, bringing an end to a chapter that would forever be etched in the annals of history. The mystery surrounding the leopard of Rudra Prayag's transformation into a man-eater has for a long time been a subject of much speculation and debate. What factors could drive an animal which typically preys on smaller mammals to develop such a voracious appetite for human flesh? Corbett, having spent considerable time studying and hunting man-eaters, developed a theory of his own. He postulated that the leopard's initial taste for human flesh might have in fact been accidental, stemming from the unfortunate circumstances of the time. The earlier 20th century was a challenging period for Rudra Prayag. Disease epidemics, particularly cholera, swept through villages claiming countless of lives. Additionally, the world was grappling with the devastating effects of the Spanish flu in 1918, a pandemic that left millions dead globally. In the remote villages of Rudra Prayag, the sheer number of deaths meant that not all bodies received proper burials. Some were left exposed, either due to fear of contagion or the sheer and overwhelming number of deceased. Corbett believed that the leopard, possibly while scavenging, might have come across these unburied bodies, thus developing a taste for human flesh. And once it realized that the humans were easy prey, especially in a region where they were abundant and accessible, the leopard's hunting patterns permanently shifted, as did its preference of prey. 
Parallels with other man-eaters, like the infamous Pinar leopard, which also turned to human prey, contributed to his conclusion. Today, the terror of the past is but a distant memory, yet it has managed to leave a permanent mark on Rudra Prayak. Till today, a signboard stands tall at the very spot where the leopard's reign of terror was brought to an end by Jim Corbett's bullet, serving not just as a grim reminder of the past, but also as a tribute to the resilience and spirit of the people of Rudra Prayag. And every year, a fair is organized in the region, drawing locals and tourists alike. Here, amid the festivities, the tale of the man-eating leopard of Rudra Prayag is till this day recounted and passed down from one generation to the next. The following true story is known as one of the most mysterious fatal elephant attacks on a human in recorded history. In the spring of 2022, Raipal village resident Maya Murmu was not only killed by an elephant in a violent encounter, but it's the horror that took place during her funeral that left many questioning the motives behind this unprecedented attack. Nestled within the vast expanse of Odisha lies the Mayurbanj district, a region known for its rich cultural tapestry and deep-rooted traditions. And it's here in the heart of Rasa Gobinpur that Raipal village lies. A village that's not merely defined by its geographical coordinates, but by its rich history as well as the collective spirit of its people. It was amidst the backdrop of Raipal that this fateful incident would unfold, forever changing the narrative of not just the village, but its perception of one of India's most revered animals. The Elephant Maya Murmu, at 70 years of age, was a figure of resilience and wisdom in Raipal village. Throughout her entire life, she had witnessed the changing seasons, the ebbs and flows of village life, as well as the evolving relationship between her community and the surrounding forest. Her hands, visibly weathered through the decades of time and laborious work, told stories of countless sunrises and sunsets, of traditions upheld, and of a life deeply intertwined with the rhythms of nature. The forest or jungle that bordered Raipal was more than just a vast expanse of green, it was in fact the keeper of stories passed down through generations. Tales of spirits, ancient guardians, and of course its mesmerizing wildlife echoed in the whispers of the leaves and the songs of the birds. And for these villagers, the jungle was both a provider and a protector, and its mysteries and inhabitants were not just respected, but even worshipped. On that spring morning, Maya set out on a familiar path towards the waterhole located just outside the boundaries of the Dalma Wildlife Sanctuary. This waterhole, a lifeline for the village, was a place where the paths of man and nature often intersected, with both villagers and wildlife frequenting its banks. Elephants and villagers had crossed paths many times before, typically resulting in peaceful exchanges or in other cases mutual avoidance. But Maya's encounter, of course, would be much different. A male elephant, its massive form dwarfing the tallest trees around, would abruptly step into the clearing its skin bearing the marks of battles fought and won, and its eyes holding decades of wisdom. Towering at a height that exceeded 10 feet, its tusks, curved and sharp, would catch the glint of the morning sun, signaling its status as a dominant force of the Indian jungle. Panic would then set in as Maya tried to flee from the oncoming danger, but the dense underbrush and uneven terrain made her escape even more challenging, and in just a few moments, the elephant with its powerful strides and surprising agility for its size closed the distance Maya would at this point, in a desperate bid to save her own life, try to seek refuge among the trees and foliage. But the elephant's relentless assault would prove her efforts futile, and after a few seemingly long but in actuality brief moments, a helpless Maya would then find herself cornered by the world's largest living land mammal, who would then proceed to brutally trample her to death. This particular jungle is home to a variety of the world's most awe-inspiring creatures, from herbivores like the sambar deer to big cats like tigers and leopards. It is also of course home to the majestic elephant, some of which bore scars inflicted by humans, not just on their bodies, but deep within their psyche. Elephants with their immense size and strength have not only been revered globally as symbols of power and wisdom, but they've also played pivotal roles in human history. In ancient times, these gentle giants were trained for warfare, serving as formidable weapons on the battlefield. The Carthaginian general Hannibal is perhaps the most famous figure to have utilized war elephants, leading his troops on the backs of them across the Alps to attack the Roman Republic. These elephants, often adorned with armor and carrying towers filled with archers, would charge into enemy lines, causing chaos and panic. The animosity between Rome and Carthage had already led to one major conflict, known as the First Punic War, 
which ended in a Carthaginian defeat. Hamilcar Barca had played a significant role in that war, and it was under his tutelage that Hannibal developed a deep-seated animosity towards Rome. Thus, his use of war elephants is most famously associated with the Second Punic War, which began in 218 BC. This was the year that Hannibal decided to lead his army, which included a contingent of war elephants, on an overland route from Spain through the treacherous terrain of the Alps and into the Italian peninsula, a journey which was fraught with challenges. The rugged mountain passes, unpredictable weather, and hostile native tribes made the expedition perilous, and the elephants, not so native to such cold and harsh conditions, would thus suffer, but would still play a huge psychological role, instilling fear and awe in both allies and enemies. Upon descending from the Alps, the sight of the elephants, which were in fact unfamiliar to many in Italy, would provide a significant morale boost to Hannibal's troops, not to mention war elephants were a sight to behold on the battlefield. They were adorned with thick armor, made from metal or leather, which were designed to fit the elephant's massive frame, providing a balance between protection and mobility. And atop these elephants, large wooden towers, known as howdahs, were mounted. These towers were often filled with archers and soldiers armed with projectiles, and the height advantage offered by these towers allowed archers to rain down arrows upon the enemy from a higher vantage point, making them supremely effective against infantry and cavalry units. But the relationship between humans and elephants has even darker chapters if one were to look further in history. In South and Southeast Asia, elephants were used for torture and as instruments of capital punishment. Execution by elephant was a method of public execution in which trained elephants would crush, dismember, or torture captives in front of large crowds. These executions were not only a method of administering justice, but also served as a demonstration of the ruler's absolute power and the grim fate that awaited those that opposed them. During these tortures, trained elephants would be commanded by their mahouts, or elephant trainers, to administer a variety of brutal punishments. Some elephants were trained to crush the condemned underfoot, using their massive weight to deliver a swift end, whereas other elephants were instructed to slowly dismember, torture, and prolong the final moments of a person in a gruesome public display. And the method chosen, of course, often depended on the nature of the crime. These public executions were held in open areas, often in the hearts of villages or busy districts, ensuring a large gathering. But over time, as societies evolved and views on capital punishment changed, the practice of execution by elephant became much less common and was eventually outlawed. Now the reason I mention this history is because this likely has a connection with Maya's story, because elephants, who once again are known for their intricate social structures, deep emotional connections, and not to mention strong ability to remember, can be profoundly affected by such traumatic experiences. In fact, modern studies have shown that elephants who have lived through traumas such as culling can display disrupted social behavior or aggressiveness towards humans for decades after incidents occur, which means that these majestic creatures with memories that can last a lifetime sometimes carry the weight of their pasts, making their interactions with humans all the more unpredictable, especially in the wild. This is why once they delved deeper into the attack on Maya, many experts made suggestions that this was perhaps not just any elephant, but one that may have been carrying the weight of its own traumatic past. Maya's lifeless body bearing grievous injuries would later be discovered by nearby locals, and the news of Maya's death would spread quickly, plunging the entire village into mourning. One would think that at this point, an occurrence as rare and tragic as this one was enough for the villagers of Raipal to deal with for one day. But as briefly pointed out in the beginning of this video, there was a mysterious and not to mention unprecedented aspect to this story that followed Maya's untimely demise. As the funeral rites commenced, the atmosphere was thick with grief, but the somber mood was soon interrupted by the distant sound of rustling leaves and heavy footsteps. The very same elephant that had taken Maya's life earlier that day was seen approaching the funeral ground. The mourners, consisting of family and villagers, paralyzed by a mix of fear and disbelief, watched as the massive creature made its way towards Maya's body. In a move that defied all logic and understanding, the elephant would then suddenly charge directly at Maya's body, knocking it off the funeral pyre and trampling it once more. The sheer audacity and inexplicability of the act sent the villagers into a state of panic. Many fled the scene, while others watched from a distance, too stunned to move. The elephant lingered for a few moments, surveying the scene with an air of dominance before slowly retreating back into the jungle. The funeral ground was meanwhile left in disarray, with the villagers still in utter shock and disbelief, trying to process the double tragedy that had befallen them in the span of just 24 hours. The act of the elephant returning to its victim, especially during such a sacred ceremony, was something the villagers had never witnessed or even heard of before. Word of the incident would rapidly spread, and this time it was not just within Raipal, 
but due to the shocking and not to mention mysterious nature of it, it also spread to neighboring villages and beyond. The story of Maya and the elephant's inexplicable behavior became the subject of hushed conversations, late night discussions, and debates among the community elders. Many sought answers from local wildlife experts hoping to shed light on the elephant's actions, but definitive explanations would remain elusive, though of course leading theories once again seem to suggest a possible link between this particular elephant having had negative interactions with humans at some point in its life. As days turned to weeks, the village would slowly begin to heal, but the scars of that fateful day remained. Vigils were held in memory of Maya, and the villagers would go on to take measures to prevent future encounters, especially near the waterhole where Maya was attacked. Of all the animals that are typically known to attack humans, the least expected of them are often the ones that surprise us the most. For instance, certain animals, especially among herbivores, just do not strike most of us as particularly dangerous, let alone ferocious. In today's episode, however, we delve into the dark side of one such animal that has time and time again proven that it's a force to be reckoned with. Standing at around 6 feet tall, the moose is the tallest mammal in North America. These ungulates have little interest in humans and are generally not aggressive, but depending on the circumstances and motivation, this seemingly docile deer can easily turn into a flailing wild beast that can inflict substantial damage to an unsuspecting victim. Oftentimes, they administer brutal maulings that can include injuries such as broken bones, lacerations, and in more severe cases, even death. It was one of these mighty creatures that 58-year-old Robert Standerwick of Cole Creek, Colorado would encounter while walking his dogs on one fateful summer morning, a day that would alter the course of his life forever. For 24 years, Standerwick lived peacefully in his Colorado home on Hummingbird Lane in the aforementioned small town of Cole Creek, located in Boulder County, a close-knit community nestled in the shadow of Crescent Mountain. Standerwick was accustomed to living in a small, somewhat rural town amid nature and wildlife. He would also religiously walk his dog's phantom and magic three times a day down a trail along the creek. He would follow the exact same path every day without incident until one summer morning when he'd suddenly cross paths with a moose and her calf. Standerwick had been walking phantom and magic along one of the trails through the green belt when he would abruptly hear the sounds of branches snapping loudly. He could not hear or see anything ahead of him due to a hairpin bend in the road, and it was at this point that suddenly out of nowhere, the massive mother moose then emerged from an aspen grove about 5 feet away from him and began charging straight at him. There was no time for him to run or get behind a tree, and before he knew it, the 1200 pound beast had knocked him to the ground and was standing on top of him. It's important to note that this was not the first time that Standerwick had encountered this particular mother and her calf. It's just that they'd never caught him by surprise before, as on previous encounters, Standerwick had always spotted her well in advance, giving him enough time to divert to another trail. I've seen her in the past, and, and when we see her or her with her baby, we know to divert, turn either turn around or divert to another trail, and she's never had a problem with that. By the time, by the time I recognized that she was coming right at me, I was on the ground. Standerwick knew that he only had seconds to react or be crushed to a pulp, which is when he hurriedly reached into his right pocket and pulled out a small firearm, but in a strong display of humanity and character, he hesitated to shoot, as despite the deadly situation that he found himself in, the animal lover did not want to risk mortally wounding the moose. He would then rapidly fire two warning shots into the ground next to them, finally managing to stun the mother moose, who then ran off with her calf in tow. A relieved yet badly injured Standerwick would then attempt to hobble back home, but would only manage to get halfway before eventually running out of energy, collapsing to the ground in exhaustion and agony. Standerwick's odds at this point were bleak. However, to his good fortune, help was not far away. Approximately a quarter of a mile away, Colin Howe, a neighbor of Standerwick's, had just stepped out of the shower when he heard gunshots echoing into the canyon. Howe immediately thought of a bear that had been seen around the neighborhood, assuming that someone might have fired warning shots to scare it away, an instance not foreign to him. However, once he heard the cries of the man in distress, he of course knew that something was terribly wrong, which is when he ran outside and caught sight of Standerwick's two dogs, who'd been running around and barking frantically. Howe would then immediately search the area, and a short time later would find a motionless Standerwick lying on the ground. His injuries included blunt force trauma to the head, his hand was badly severed, and he had a hoof print on his chest. It was at this point that Howe alerted his wife to call 911, while he stayed with and comforted Standerwick until help finally arrived. Standerwick was rushed to the hospital and treated for his injuries, which were once again to his good fortune, non-lethal. And following the incident, he remarked on just how lucky he was not only to survive being trampled, but also to have been found and rescued. 
How, the hero in the story, would later reveal that he found Standerwick in a remote part of the woods that no one really went down. So had he not been there, Standerwick's situation would have been much worse. And moreover, had Standerwick not had a firearm, he likely would not have been able to scare off the moose with those warning shots, which may have very well cost him his life. The incident would go on to reinforce the respect for these mighty creatures throughout the Coal Creek community, and according to how the moose population showed up just a few years prior to this incident, and residents have reported seeing them much more frequently. And because they are by far the most dangerous animals in the area, and are more feared by some members of the community than mountain lions, bobcats, and even bears, this of course is not a good thing. Now when considering why this particular incident was so dangerous, we already mentioned that the moose that attacked Standerwick was a female with a calf, so it did make sense that she would be on high alert. Her actions could also be a result of being startled by Standerwick, who surprised her on the trail as she did him. And when she spotted him coming around the bend, she did what mothers do and protected her baby from the perceived threat. And it's for this reason that moose cows are especially dangerous during late spring and early summer, when calves are still young. But it's important to note that in general, based on many other incidents, it would seem that encounters with moose are not as unusual as one might think. And while it's important to note that moose are not naturally aggressive, they can become dangerous when surprised or startled, which triggers their fight or flight instinct, and this happens especially during mating season or when a mother is protecting her calf. Not to mention the presence of dogs can also set them off, as they may see them as predators. In the case of Robert Standerwick, he found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Standerwick acted commendably in response to the attack, and not only was he able to save his own life, but his empathy and his caring nature also helped him spare the life of the mother moose, and most likely her calf. Without his sense of compassion and quick thinking in the face of danger, things could easily have gone the other way for him. It's unfortunate that not everyone shares the same respect upon encountering dangerous animals. There are many clips out there of people taking unnecessary chances and even antagonizing wild animals. One such incident occurred earlier this year in Montana when a moose attacked a man who kept taunting the animal even after being warned by onlooking residents. Go ahead and try it. Go ahead and try it. See what happens. Get the f away from the moose. No, it's on a foot. Get him. Yeah, get him. Yes. Get him. As you can see here, they were warned multiple times, and they're extremely lucky that this didn't turn out way worse than it did. And of course, idiocy aside, there are many instances where even innocent people who are just minding their own business have found themselves on the wrong side of the hoof. Hey, 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 watch out! Watch out! According to experts, one of the best courses of action when facing a charging moose is to get out of sight or behind an obstacle. However, depending on the circumstances, this of course may not be possible and is not always effective. That's why carrying bear spray and being armed, if the law allows it, is crucial. Fortunately, most moose attacks are non-fatal, but thousands of people are injured by these robust animals annually in the United States alone. And as mentioned before, in the northern regions, moose are considered by some to be even more dangerous than bears. And due to their rising population numbers in these areas, where they end up in close proximity to humans, the number of moose encounters are naturally higher. In the end, it's always important to remember that taking precautions and respecting the risks when wild animals are around, especially ones as formidable as moose, is crucial in order to coexist peacefully with nature and her beasts. With the many potential dangers that one could encounter on an African safari, from lions to crocodiles, it's almost ironic that the animal responsible for the most human fatalities is not even a predator. The hippopotamus is known to be one of the most dangerous animals on the African continent, and in March of 96, safari guide Paul Templer discovered just how ferocious these massive herbivores can be when he ended up waist-deep in the mouth of a hippo. On a Saturday morning in Zimbabwe, southern Africa, Paul Templer's day started with a sense of foreboding. A close friend of his who was supposed to be leading a canoe safari had come down with malaria, and Templer was the man assigned to be his replacement as the lead guide. Templer recalled having a feeling of trepidation that day, like something was just not quite right. The opportunity, however, was a great one, as he was to lead a tour group down one of the most beautiful stretches of river in the world. The Zambezi River is the fourth longest river in Africa, serving as the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Its basin supports a vast wilderness area that boasts a wide variety of game, bird life, and freshwater species, including a healthy population of hippos. Now as mentioned, hippos are non-predatory animals. They subsist on a diet predominantly made up of plants, and as nocturnal animals, they graze on the banks at night and spend their days in the water. But what's more important to understand is that hippopotamuses are highly territorial and aggressive by nature. These qualities, combined with its size and length of its tusks, made the hippo more dangerous than some of the fiercest predators. The safari group was made up of six guests, three apprentice guides, and Templar, who as previously mentioned, was the lead guide. Everything was going smoothly, and everyone was having a great time. 
until the group would suddenly encounter a pod of about a dozen hippos wallowing in the shallows. To the group, the hippos seemed relaxed and calm at this time as they were a safe distance away. Templar, who was leading the way in the river, got the group together and pulled up next to the hippos. They then sat in their canoes watching them and talking about them briefly before moving off. One of the guests even asked if it was true that hippos killed more people every year than every other animal, which Templar confirmed to be true, and just as they made their way around the pod, one of the canoes had fallen back and was heading towards deeper waters. Suddenly, there was a loud thud amid the crashing water, as a hippo would make contact with the back of the canoe of one of the guides. Evans Namasengo was Templar's 26-year-old apprentice who'd been following him at the back of the group. Templar would turn just in time to see Namasengo's canoe hurled about four feet in the air by the hippo who was breaching out of the water. Namasengo was catapulted out of the canoe and was carried by the current toward a mother hippo and her calf. Knowing that he had to get to Namasengo fast, Templar wouldn't have time to drop off his guests. He would instead yell to one of the other guides to get everyone to safety as he turned his canoe and started paddling towards Namasengo in the river. He would then suddenly notice a bow-shaped wave coming toward him and judging by its size, he knew it had to have been either a hippo or a really large crocodile. It was at this point that Templar would begin slapping his pad in the water, which seemed to have halted the approaching animal. Templar would finally get to Namasengo and reach over with a helping hand, in what was like a moment made for Hollywood. Namasengo had been reaching out of the water, and the two men's fingers would almost touch, when suddenly the water between them erupted, and everything went dark and quiet. Templar was head first down the throat of a hippo, up to his waist, with the warm and wet darkness engulfing him and incredible pressure on his lower back, he was also not able to move. Now it is worth mentioning that Templar was not a small guy, and he'd been so far down the hippo's throat that it ended up gagging and spitting him out. This would allow Templar to grab hold of the hippo's tusks to pull himself out. Just as he broke through the surface, gasping for air, he would come face to face with a stunned Namasengo. We need to get out of here, he said to his frightened apprentice, which is when Templar started swimming to safety. However, it was at this time that something would tell him to turn around, which is when upon doing so, he would notice that Namasengo wasn't following behind him. In fact, he was still where Templar left him, with his eyes wide open, frozen in terror and panic as he tried to stay afloat. Templar then turned back to get him and was moving in for a classic lifesaver's hold, when there was abruptly yet another burst of water as he was hit from below, finding himself once again waist deep inside the hippo's throat. This time it was his lower body, and the hippo had been much more aggressive, thrashing him around. Templar recalled that all he could do during this part of the attack was try his best not to drown. To his good fortune, the hippo would then spit him out again, but Templar knew that it wasn't over yet, and he had to get out of the water. He again then tried swimming to safety, and was making good progress when he looked over at mid-stroke and saw the hippo charging toward him with its mouth wide open. This time the hippo made a direct hit and chomped down on his abdomen, leaving his head, neck, and shoulders hanging out of one side of its mouth, with his legs dangling out of the other. By now the hippo had launched an aggressive attack, and at one point it would even fling him in the air, contorting his body into a half twist. And when he fell back, the hippo caught him in its mouth again, and bit down so hard that Templar thought he was being bitten in half. One of the eyewitnesses who was a guest at the safari would later state that the scene was like watching a vicious dog trying to rip a ragdoll apart. At this point for Templar, everything felt like it was happening in slow motion, which at this time was strangely fortunate for him because it allowed him time to think through his next moves. Moments later, Templar would then grab on to the tusks that were boring through him, realizing that holding on to them would to an extent stop his flesh from tearing as the hippo thrashed him about. Each time he was dunked underwater, Templar held his breath, and every time he surfaced, he would gasp for air. This went on for a while, but then the hippo would finally grow tired and dive for deeper water. Templar recalls that at this point he was just lying at the bottom of the river, looking up with the lower half of his body still inside the hippo's mouth. He remembers seeing green and blue as the sunlight broke the water surface, but around him, the water was tinged red with his blood, causing him to wonder whether he was going to drown or bleed to death. In a later interview, Templar would speak about the random thoughts going through his mind before the hippo finally lurched towards the surface and spat him out for the third time. Fortunately, another guide named Mac was at the surface in the safety of the kayak after having courageously paddled toward the angry hippo as it waged its attack. Mac and Templar managed to get up onto a rock, knowing that the massive hippo wouldn't be able to climb up after them. Mac did whatever he could to patch Templar's horrific wounds with emergency first aid supplies and pieces of fabric he'd ripped off from their shirts. He then pulled Templar back into one of the canoes, at which point they'd head on to try to find Namasengo. By this time, it was already getting dark, and they knew the chances of anyone coming to look for them were slim. To make matters worse, Templar was in bad shape. He was in immense pain, watching his blood swirl around the water at the bottom of the canoe and what was worse was that the hippo was still bumping against them. 
For a moment, Templar thought to himself, do I stay or do I go? He even contemplated shutting his eyes and allowing himself to drift off and let go, but he would manage to resist this urge and will himself to fight through it. And at that moment, he was finally overcome with an incredible sense of peace beyond anything he had ever experienced. Ironically, the moment he'd made this choice to fight to survive, his body was overcome with more pain than he ever thought possible. He later said that the pain was so intense that he wished he had made another choice, but by then not even that seemed to be an option any longer. The two men would eventually make it out to shore, but they'd failed to track down Namasengo. It took eight long hours to get Templar to a hospital that had a surgeon who could operate on him, and the damage was substantial. He would have 38 major bite wounds, and his left arm had been crushed to a pulp, as he was degloved from the elbow down, which means that his skin and flesh from that point had been torn off. He would also sustain a punctured lung, which Mac had smartly sealed with a saran wrap from a plate of snacks. Not to mention a tusk had also skewered his foot, tearing out his Achilles tendon. And to make matters even worse, he also had deep bite wounds throughout his shoulders, and in fact both of his arms were barely attached. The doctors would also mention that he'd been bitten through the back of his neck, as well as his head, all the way through to the front of his face, missing the top of his spinal column by an inch. Templar remembered acting out and feeling sorry for himself when the surgeon cut his arm off. He also remembered the surgeon saying to him that he was the sum of his choices, and that he was exactly who, what, and where he chose to be in life. Needless to say, at the time, Templar was less than impressed by the doctor's comments, feeling that it was easier to blame everyone and everything else for what had happened to him. But over time, the surgeon's words would sink in, and Templar realized that things were always going to happen, and that the one thing that no one could ever take away was his choice over what happens next. Templar would go on to believe that this is the lesson the hippo taught him on the fateful day that he found himself facing death in the mouth of one of the most dangerous animals in Africa.